Amen. All right. Well, again, we uh, are going to continue the series this morning uh, entitled Called from Creation, and we are looking at uh, the reason why we are on this great big ball of mud that we go around called Earth, okay? Why are we created? Why are we on this Earth? And just in a quick review uh, for the first few minutes here, Proverbs 16, 4, says, the Lord has made everything. By the way, are you in everything? Okay, this is talking about you. The Lord has made everything for his own purpose, all right? So again, you are on this earth for, not for your purpose, you're on this earth for his purpose, all right? And at what purpose were you created? Well, it goes on here, uh, switching books to Isaiah 43. And it says, everyone, again, are you and everyone? Okay, I'm glad a few of you are. Everyone who is called by my name, I'll stop right there, are you called by his name? I just want to establish that this is for you, okay? Are you called by his name? Okay, what's that mean, called by his name? Uh, I've got sons that are running around. My name is Brett Mackey, okay? Uh, my son's names are Mackey as well, okay? I got little Mackeys running around. They are called after my name, okay, because I am their father, their earthly father. If God is your heavenly father, okay, if you have submitted your life to him, all right, then you are called by his name. Is there anybody in this place that is called by his name? Okay, and then this is talking about you, okay? Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for what? For my glory, okay? There's why you're created. You're created for his glory, and he goes on and says, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. So again, the purpose why we are created, okay, the, the calling from creation is this, that we would bring God glory with our life. Now, why, again, is it important for us to know our purpose, why, why we are called uh, from creation to do a certain thing, okay? We've got to understand our purpose because as we talked last week, if we don't know the purpose of, of something, what we do is we end up misusing it, we end up abusing it, and if we abuse it long enough, what happens is it begins to break apart. And that's what we see that many of us do with our lives, don't we? We really sometimes don't understand, we forget sometimes really what our purpose is, and what we try to do is redefine our life by what our heart says that we need to define it as. And the Bible's pretty clear about that, saying, don't listen to your heart. Your heart is deceptible above all things, okay, that we shouldn't listen to our flesh. We shouldn't listen to what our heart is telling us, this is what you need for our life. We need to look at our creator, God, and understand why are we created? What is our purpose? And when we understand what our purpose is, all right, then we can put the pieces together and our life won't begin to break apart like it does for so many people. As people that have submitted their life to Christ, and I pray that you have, that you have made Jesus Christ your Lord, that you've absolutely submitted everything to him, those people that submit their life to him, we should know what our purpose is. We should know why we are created, what is the reason for our existence. And again, our purpose is to bring him glory, period. And this begins to happen Again, as we look and review that when we have a contrite heart before him, okay, when we are, there's no pride within us, when we humble ourselves before him, when we bring ourselves to that spiritual altar, lay ourselves down and say, God, I now am that sacrifice, and we begin to authentically worship him, not just on Sunday morning like what we just did, but every day of our life, every moment of our life that we give our lives to him as a sacrifice to him. And he says, you know what? When you begin to do that, when you begin to humble yourself before me, when you begin to be that sacrifice and you submit your life to me, that is the environment that I dwell in. Isaiah 57, 15 says, I dwell in the high and the holy place with him who has a contrite and a humble spirit. Okay, when we can reverse that if we want, it says he, God could, could have said, I do not dwell in the high and holy place with him who has prideful spirit within him, okay? So again, we need to examine ourselves. Do we have any pride within ourselves? When we look at our lives, do we exalt ourselves over other people? Because the Bible says, don't do that. It says, but put everybody before you. And humble yourself before God. And when you begin to do that and have that broken spirit, that contrite spirit, says, that is the time, that is the environment that I dwell in. And we look in Scripture, and case after case from Moses going before God, and many, many times Elijah going before God upon that mountain when he was crying, he was broken out, and God showed up. We see Isaiah as he's taken up before God. We see 
Uh, what we know is Saul that turned to Paul on that road to Damascus that he encountered God. We see John that he encountered God. And each of them, they fell before God in absolute humility. And what happened when they fell before God in humility and that contrite spirit? The glory of God then was revealed to them. And we see that their lives were transformed. They were reshaped. And here's what happened. They were reshaped to reflect the glory of God. Not just to give glory to God, but they were redirected in their life to actually start to reflect the glory of God. So what we've got to understand is our first calling from creation is to give God glory because he deserves it, doesn't he? And what is, what is that whole thing all about, giving God glory? It's just acknowledging his greatness in our life. It's, it's thinking about why are we doing this? I was talking to the worship team before we came out in that very room and saying, why are you doing this? Why are you standing upon this stage? Think about why you're standing here. Think about why you're worshiping him. Why are you giving glory to him? What is that thing that, that you're looking at going, God, you are so magnificent. You're so awesome. And that's what we need to do. We need to acknowledge his greatness. Now, as we take a look at this pattern in 1 Chronicles chapter 16, it gives us kind of a pattern of bringing glory to God. And there's a couple things I want you to see in this as we move on. So again, 1 Chronicles 16, if you want to turn there, go ahead. We're going to be uh, around the Bible for a little bit. Is it okay if I read scripture in church? Okay, very good. Okay, it says this in verse 28. It says, give to the Lord. So the first thing we do is we've got to give something to the Lord. It says, give to the Lord, O families of the peoples, give to the Lord glory and strength. Okay, so that we're giving him glory. We're give, giving him strength. And it goes on here, and it says, give to the Lord glory. Glory do his name. And then the second part of this says, then bring an offering and come before him. Oh, worship the Lord and the beauty of his holiness. So the first part we've got to do is we've got to give him glory. Now, how in the world do we give him glory? And let me just say this, that we have got to physically express glory to God. We've got to physically express it when we come to the understanding, the knowledge within our spirit of how great he really is. Now, let me just show you something in Luke chapter 17. Okay, and I'm just going to re read, or not, I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to summarize what took place here. Remember the story of the ten lepers? Jesus was walking through the, 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 the countryside, and he comes upon this colony of lepers. Now, you've got to understand something about lepers. Okay, lepers, when they got leprosy, they were ostracized from the rest of the community. Meaning that they had to live together. They weren't allowed to come to anybody, okay? So again, they were separated from their, their wife. They were separated from their kids or from their, their spouse or whatever. They couldn't come around anymore. And Jesus is walking through the countryside. Here he is, a kosher rabbi, walking through the countryside. And it was against the law, okay, that these lepers would even come close to anybody, let alone a kosher rabbi. So they're standing off the distance, and they're screaming because they have heard of Jesus. Jesus, have mercy upon me. Heal us, Jesus. And it says Jesus is walking through there, and I imagine he stops and looks, and he sees these lepers out there, and he walks towards these lepers. And it says that he had great compassion upon him, and he demonstrates his greatness to these lepers, and he heals them of their disease. Now, here's what I need you to see. There's 10 lepers that he heals, okay? They all begin to walk away. Matter of fact, this is what he says. He says, you walk, and once you start walking away, okay, then you're going to be healed. And I imagine as they were healed, don't you think that all 10 of them were probably in absolute gratitude for what God had done? I think they were. I mean, again, get the picture. These lepers, how would you like it if you couldn't go and you couldn't hug your kids anymore? I mean, they didn't have a life. You can never go and, and have real good fellowship with your wife anymore. I mean, their life was over, and Jesus heals them. And I'm, I'm assuming they're walking away with great gratitude in their minds, thanking God for what happened. But this is what I want you to see is that only one of them came back and really gave glory to God. Luke 17, 14, let me read the quick context here. It says, so when, we, or so when he saw them, he said to them, go, show yourself to the priests. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. Now, I just want you to stop right there a second, okay? And this is something we're going to look at in just a minute here. But this is right here is a pattern that you need to see that goes all through the Bible. That they first stepped out and began to walk before God did the supernatural in their life. You see this? He says, you go first, and once you go, then I'm going to heal you. 
Okay, and this is a pattern, again, we're going to see that we first go and then the supernatural happens. Okay, verse 15, it says, and one of them, when he saw he was healed, returned with a, now look, he returned in his mind saying, I glorify God. Is that what he says? No. What's it say? He returned with a loud voice. He glorified God, and he stand, stood there like this, right? No. Did you, you guys see this? There was a physical expression taking place here as he was glorifying God, right? It says he fell down on his face, giving him thanks. Okay, so what I need you to see here is what did he do differently than what the other nine did? Because, again, I think the other nine went away with gratitude in their minds, but was that really glorifying God? To worship, to glorify God, it says the one drew back near and he physically expressed his gratitude to God. We need to physically express our gratitude to God. And I hope Lifehouse Church becomes a church that is not one of the nine lepers. I hope this is a church, maybe we should rename the church, we are one leper. <laughs> that we come before God and we don't just in our mind just say, thank you God. But the church of the one leper, <laughs> no, things I come up with. Life else church, the church of the one leper, we fall before God. We express our gratitude before God, not just in our minds, but we are expressive saying, thank you, God. Thank you for healing me. Thank you for setting me free. So again, what we see in First Chronicles here is, first of all, is we give to the Lord, O families of the people. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory do his name, okay? To give glory to the Lord, we express it. But then the next thing it says, but bring an offering and come before him, O worship the Lord in his beauty and of his holiness. So again, the first thing we do, the first called from creation that we need to do is we physically express our gratitude to him. But secondly, it says that you need to bring an offering. You need to bring an offering. Now, again, what offering do we bring to God as we glorify him? We bring our very lives, don't we? I mean, isn't that probably one of the most well-known scriptures, Romans 12? It says, I therefore beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, your very life as this living sacrifice that is holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of service, okay? And some translations say it's your reasonable act of worship okay by presenting your bodies bringing yourself before the the spiritual altar saying god here i am consume me god i am that offering god and the thing that we've got to do as we laid it ourselves down on the altar as a sacrifice is we've got to die tell me this is a sacrifice a sacrifice if it gets off the altar and walks away no a sacrifice goes to the altar and a sacrifice literally dies on the altar, that we are called to die to ourselves, that we are not our own anymore, but we are God's. So we've got to die to ourselves, and that's the second part of our calling. Again, that we express our gratitude to God, but we bring an offering. So we not only give him glory, but as we humbly submit as a sacrifice, and we have this contrite spirit before him, and we kneel down and say, God, here I am, I'm expressing to you physically how much I care for you. He says, that's, that's the, the, the arena. That's the environment that I dwell in. I don't dwell in those places where you stand like this and your theme song is, I shall not be moved. He says, I don't dwell in those, those areas. I dwell when people fall before me and they're crying to me and they're, they're, they're giving me gratitude and they're offering themselves. And in that whole arena, that environment, that's where you're going to encounter my, as the Old Testament says, my Shekinah glory, okay, that manifest presence of God. And that's why I'm so driven by this for this church to, to, to not just to come to Lifehouse Church just to hear me talk, but that you come to experience, to encounter the presence of God, to encounter that glory, because only when you're in that glory will you be transformed, and when you're transformed, then you move into what you're called to do, and that's not only to give him glory, but that's to reflect his glory. See, when a person comes into contact, encounters the true glory of God, Tell you what, it is not possible. It's not possible to go away unchanged. You will be changed when that glory, that manifest presence of God comes upon your life. 
something's going to happen in your life. We see it all through Scripture. We look at Moses. Moses is walking through the desert. He sees the burning bush. He encounters the glory of God, and he is changed. His destiny, his trajectory is changed. We see this with, uh, with Elijah. Again, he's on that mountain crying out to God. He's scared. And the presence of God shows up in this whisper. And again, he gives Elijah this new destiny for his life. Uh, Isaiah, he's taken up into the throne room of God. And in this throne room of God, he's, he's, he's taken back by the glory of God. And, and uh, he feels like he's undone, like he's wrecked, he's ruined because he's in the presence of this glory of God. And, and of course, an angel comes up and, and heals him. And what happens after that as he's manifesting this presence of God? He stands up and says, right here. I don't care what anybody else wants to do, send me. Send me, God. I don't care what it is, but send me. We look at Saul that later became Paul. He's on the road to Damascus. He's a Pharisee of all Pharisees persecuting the church. And just a glimpse of the glory of God knocks him off his horse and scales come upon his eyes. And Jesus says, Paul, Paul, or Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, go into the city, and then I will tell you what you should do. The whole trajectory of life changed when he came into the presence of God. And this is what we see. The trajectory of your life will change as well when you come into the presence of God. God will speak vision to you. And we see all of these cases here that once they were in the presence of God, there was great inspiration that took place in their life, not just to come and to glorify God, to give him glory, but to become vessels that would assume uh, so we would soon reflect the very glory of God. And that's what we're called to do. We're called to reflect the glory of God. Now, as we talk about the glory of God, what exactly is the glory of God? When you come into the presence of his glory, what do you feel? What do you understand? What knowledge comes upon you? And this is what I believe that takes place. I believe in the glory of God and what the glory of God is, is just a greater, deeper understanding of what his attributes are. If you ever are taken into the glory of God, that manifest presence, I'm not talking about the omnipresence, but when you know that you know that you know that the presence of God is upon you, and you begin to get emotional in your spirit, why is that? And I think it's because you start to understand the attributes of God. You begin to feel his compassion. You begin to feel his faithfulness. You begin to see his mercy, his love. You begin to understand his majesty. You begin to, to comprehend his power. You begin to truly understand his holiness. That is his glory when you start to understand that more and more and it comes upon your spirit. As we see in different contexts of the Bible and Exodus 33 with Moses when he comes into contact with the spirit upon that mountain and we see Isaiah in Isaiah 6 as I just talked about in that throne room. We see that their physical and their, their, their minds, their physical minds and their physical bodies, they really, they couldn't deal with the, the, the manifest presence of, of the Spirit. I mean, Moses says, let me see you, and God says, you can't see me. I'll hide you. You might be able to see a glimpse of me from the backside, but you cannot see my face. You can't handle it. But here's the thing, guys. God, I don't think, can, can come and just go, wham, here's all my glory, because it would consume us all. But I believe that he gives us little glimpses of his glory, his manifest glory from time to time. And when that happens, that transforms your life to become more like him. And when we become more like him, what begins to happen is we begin to live a life that reflects his glory to this dark and this hopeless world. And that's what we're called to do, to begin to reflect his glory, not just to give him glory, but to reflect his glory. So how do we do that? We do that because when we understand his attributes, as his glory comes upon us, and we begin to take more and more of the image of Christ, okay, and we go outside of these doors and we begin to demonstrate to the world the attributes of God, what we begin to do is to reflect his glory upon the world. You know what one of God's greatest desires is? To fill the whole world, the whole earth full of his glory. That's one of his desires. I mean, over and over, look at a few of these contexts here. Psalm 72, 18 says, Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who does wondrous things, and blessed be his glorious name forever, and let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. 
Isaiah 6, that I've talked about a couple times here, probably one of my favorite scriptures here. Verse 1 says, In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood a seraphim. Each one had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried and said to the other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And lastly, Habakkuk 2.14 says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Okay, over and over and over again does God say that. He wants his glory to fill this earth. So exactly, how does that happen? How does that take place? How is his glory to fill this earth? Now, God could do the supernatural, couldn't he? I mean, he could just come down here and say, bam, here's my Shekinah glory all over the place. And again, I think it would consume us. But again, he could do this, but what we see in the Bible context, that's not really his pattern. But the second thing he could do, and the second thing that he does, is he works through the body of Christ. He works through us. And we could go outside of these doors, and we could fill the earth full of his glory as we begin reflecting the attributes of who he is, which is his glory. Now let me just show you something. And Exodus 34, by the way, this context is talking about when Moses was on Mount Sinai, and it was at Pentecost. And let me just go on down a little rabbit trail here. Um, by the way, Pentecost is going to be taking place this Saturday and Sunday, all right? Now, if you've been around Lifehouse very long, you have know that we've taught on the festivals, and God works in patterns. He works in rhythms, okay? And study the scripture about this, but God does significant things during those different feasts. Okay, now he does things all the time on earth, but those specific times, God does uh, incredible uh, works uh, on this earth during those different times. Now, uh, during Pentecost, he's done so many different things. Uh, you know, 3,500 years ago or so was when the first recorded Pentecost took place. Now, there's probably happened before that, but again, on, on that certain day of uh, Pentecost is when uh, Moses went upon that mountain and the law was given to him. And some 1,500 years later or so, uh, which would be about 2,000 years ago for us, uh, they were in the upper room, and they were praying on Pentecost, and that's when the Spirit came down again, okay? And God gave the law, but this time not written on the hearts of, or not written on the stone tablets, but the Spirit brought the law written now on the hearts of man and changed everything. So again, what I'm telling you right now is, just like in the upper room 2,000 years ago, we we're going to meet here Saturday night at 6 o'clock for uh, some worship time, and we just kind of want to replicate what took place in that upper room on Pentecost, and we want to seek God, wait upon God, and who knows, it might be an hour, could be a couple hours, however long you want to come here and worship, but again, we're just going to wait on God, so again, I'm inviting you to come uh, this Saturday night uh, during Pentecost uh, when God has done significant things over and over, it's just his rhythm, and uh, and expecting that God is going to, to do significant things as well. So again, you're invited to, to come. Now back to the context here where Moses in Exodus 34, Moses has been upon Mount Sinai during Pentecost, and God meets with him, and God brings the law down, but not only does he bring the law down, but God reveals himself, and I believe he, he brings this glory cloud down, and Moses walks down the mountain, and he is reflecting the glory of God says that his face is shining, okay? Now, this reflection of the glory of God on his face, okay, was more than the Israelites could handle. And they said, Moses, I don't know what's going on here, but you're blinding us. Your face is glowing. And he probably didn't even know it was glowing. And they were all backing up. And he says, okay, okay, okay. I'm going to cover my face. I'm going to put a veil over my face in order to talk to you. Now, Paul, follow with me here, okay? You guys still with me? In 2 Corinthians, Paul begins to talk about this encounter. He begins to talk about this glory. And the glory that Moses encountered, it was glorious. The glory was absolutely glorious. But again, it was law-based on the attributes of God. And this is why it was so glorious, because again, the law is talking about the attributes of God. It's talking about the character of God. It's talking about the boundaries that God has put upon us to protect us. So again, this glory that Moses saw and, and was upon him was, was absolutely glorious, no question about that. But it says, because it was the Old Testament glory, it was fading glory. It was fading away. And he had to keep this veil on his face until that glory faded away. Then Paul goes on, what we'll see in a minute, and he talks about this new kind of glory. 
this glory that is not talking about this, this law on tablets of stone, but it's talking about this new glory that will never fade away, written by the Spirit upon man's hearts. Take a look at this in 2 Corinthians 3, and there's a lot here. Starting in verse 7, you might want to turn in your Bibles there just to take a look at this. But it says in verse 7, it says, but if the ministry of death, okay, what is that talking about, the ministry of death? It's talking about uh, the Old Testament covenant, okay? It's talking about this, this ministry that the law, and it does, it points to death. Now, the law is great, and we need the law right now because it points us to Jesus because we can see death in it. We can see that if we don't abide by the law, we're going to hell, and we need a Savior. So that's what it's talking about. It's talking about the ministry of death, which is talking about the law. It says, written and engraved on stones was glorious, and again, it was glorious because it points us to Jesus. So that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance. Now look at this, and it says, which glory was passing away. So again, the glory that was upon Moses, it was fading. In verse 8, it says, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? Okay, by the way, backing up a little bit, it, it, again, it talks about the glory. Oh, where am I at here? Oh, verse 9. Okay, I got a little ahead of myself. Verse 9, it says, for if the ministry of condemnation, and there's another word for the Old Testament system there. It's the spirit or the ministry of condemnation. Why? Because without Jesus, without the completion of the New Testament, it is condemnation. Because nobody can uphold the whole law, right? Go through the Ten Commandments. I assure you, every person here has broke every one of them. You have. Well, I've never murdered. Oh, Jesus came and he said, well, you hate somebody. You already committed murder. Well, luckily, I've never committed adultery. Oh, yeah, you looked upon a woman with, with lust. You've already committed adultery. Every single one of them, you could go right down the line. You've broken every single one of them. And that's why without the New Testament covenant, the Old Testament covenant is a, is a covenant of condemnation because we need to finish it. There has to be a completion to the Old Testament covenant. That's why Jesus has come. So, again, for if the ministry of condemnation had glory, which it did, then the ministry of righteousness, talking about the, the, the ministry or the glory that we have now, okay, exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because the glory that excels. For what is passing away was glorious. What remains is much more glorious. He's talking about what you have. You don't have the Old Testament glory upon you, the, the glory of condemnation. You have the, 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 the glory of a life-giving spirit that's in you. It goes on here in verse 12. It says, therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of our speech. So again, we go out and we declare the glory of God because it doesn't fade away. Unlike Moses who put a veil over his face so the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. There it goes again. The glory was passing away. But verse 14, it says, but their minds were blinded. By the way, you want to know why Jewish people don't understand Jesus, don't get Jesus? It's written right here. It says, but their minds were blinded, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. Until you come to Christ, you submit your life to Christ, you still have a veil. You have religiosity on you. You've got this veil, and it's a veil that, 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 re, that, that reveals this fading glory. Verse 15, but even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their hearts. Okay, again, talking about Jewish people right here as well. There's a veil upon their hearts. Verse 16, nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. And that's a good place there to say amen. Thank you. Verse 17, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now, this is part that I want you to see here. But we all, with unveiled faces, okay, so we don't have the veiling anymore on our faces, beholding as a mirror, okay, that we are reflecting the glory of God, okay? We are as a mirror to the glory of the Lord and are being transformed in the same image from glory to to glory, and it could keep going on from glory to glory to glory to glory to glory, okay? It doesn't stop that we, again, are, are, are in the same image, and we are going from glory to glory just as the Spirit of the Lord. So again, so those who are in Christ, is there anybody here that is in Christ? 
Anybody here that has submitted their life to Christ, that is filled with the Holy Spirit, because this is talking about you going from glory to glory, okay? That we have a much more glorious glory upon us, and we need to be that mirror reflecting not the condemnation of the Old Testament ways, but that, 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 that spirit, that the glory of grace, mercy, and life by the Spirit. That was, that's what we're reflecting. And it's a glory that does not fade away. Paul says, you shall go from glory to glory to glory. You shall always be going from glory to glory to glory. This is your calling from creation, that you would not have a veiled face anymore. That you wouldn't be suffering from religiosity with your glory. You wouldn't be suffering from, this is the way we always done it type of thing. But we would choose, is what the Bible says, to walk by the Spirit, seeking the Spirit, And as we seek the Spirit, the Spirit will continue to develop us, continue to bring fresh revelation to us, continue to teach us more and more about Him and His attributes. And after spending time, guys, in that environment where God is bringing fresh revelation to you because the Spirit is breathing in you, you begin to get more and more and more excited about God, right? And then you walk outside of these doors because you're so excited about God and you become this mirror of his glory, you begin to reflect his glory as he continues to reveal more and more and more of his glory to you. See how that works? Now, this is a great, great question to ask every person here. When you came to the knowledge of Christ, remember when you came to Christ? And some of you might have just grown up in households, so maybe you don't remember it, but most of us, when we come to Christ, we get really excited about God. We learn about him. We learn about his forgiveness. We learn about his mercy. We learn about his attributes. We, we get this fresh revelation, don't we? Remember that, guys? Remember when you're just a baby Christian and you're so excited about that? You're going and telling all your friends about it and, and your experience. And, and I see some of you smiling. You remember that. Here's a question for you, though. Have you continued in your journey with God from going from that glory to the next glory to the next glory to the next glory? Are you still going from glory to glory to glory, or are you not reflecting the glory anymore? Has your glory faded? And that's a question you need to ask. Is your glory of God increasing in your life, or is the glory in God fading in your life? So you are called from creation to go from glory to glory to glory. Now, why am I telling you all that? Because it's not only your purpose to give glory to God, but you are called to reflect his glory by demonstrating a life-giving attribute to this hopeless, dying world. That is what we are called to do, to fill this earth full of his glory. Now, remember when I started this talk here several weeks ago and I was talking about this crater and how big this crater is, this God that we have, and this crater God, he's self-existent, he's self-dependent, he's self-reliant. Remember what I was saying about that? And I said, you know what? God needs nothing. He doesn't need anything from us. Remember when I said that? A couple of you do. I mean, he is all-powerful, right? Everybody can agree with that, right? I mean, this God that created <laughs> this universe, and remember I was talking about how big our, just our galaxy is. It's 100,000 light years across, and the closest next galaxy is anywhere from 80 to 100,000 light years away. And I mean, and God somehow holds that in the span of his hands or whatever. I mean, he is all powerful. And because he is all powerful, do you agree that he makes the rules? It's his power. He chooses to make the rules. He chooses to make the patterns that take place upon this earth. He chooses the principles. Now, let me just say this in retrospect of what I just said there. God does not need us for anything, but here's what we've got to understand. Even though he doesn't need us for anything, he deliberately, and I don't know why, but he deliberately chose to need us. He didn't need us, but he chose to partner with us. And you know why he chose to partner with us? Because, again, he chose that so that we go out and we would be the catalyst to bringing glory to this whole earth. You are the ones that are to go out and bring this whole earth to bring it full of his glory. I mean, this is how God does. He has partnered with us. And he started this whole pattern right from the beginning of of creation. Didn't he? Remember when God uh, created Adam? He puts Adam upon this earth. Now, God could have done everything, couldn't he have? Could God have named the animals? And what did he say to Adam? He said, Adam, you go out and name the animals. 
So here's Adam. He's, he's naming the animals. And I don't know if, if Adam wants to try to impress God, but he has all these big names, you know. He looks at this big thing and goes, <clears throat> I'll call that a hippopotamus, you know. I think God comes down and he says, Adam, really? <laughs> hippopotamus? Let's just call him a hippo, okay? You know? No, God. See that big thing over there? We'll call it a Tyrannosaurus Rex or whatever, okay? And he's naming all these long names, and God's going, come on, really? I mean, you don't make it so difficult on yourself. I don't know. I'm not reading into this. This is my pea brain probably. But I imagine, you know, and this is my imagination. God comes down to Adam. You're Adam, okay? He puts his arm around Adam and says, Adam, let's not make this so difficult. He said, uh, let me help you here. Um, see that uh, animal, right? That, that's a moose. One syllable, moose. Oh, see this over there? That's a deer. Okay, deer. That, that's all you, just a deer, okay? And oh, oh, we'll call that a duck, okay? Duck, okay? Oh, and see the big one over there? That is a goose, okay? So again, we've got a goose. You get this, Adam? We've got a goose. We've, we've got a duck. We've got, uh, oh, I kind of messed up on that one. We'll call it a cat. Um, and then uh, <laughs> chase, you know, chasing after that, uh, you know, we'll call that a dog. So, again, we got dog. We got cat. We got moose. We got goose. We got, we got deer. See, it's pretty easy, Adam, you know. But did he do that? He didn't. He said, Adam, no. You go ahead. I'm going to partner with you. And I'm going to let you, Adam, make some of the decisions here, Adam. I'm going to let you name it. See, he could have done it all, but he chose, okay, to partner with mankind. And he chose to partner with mankind to let the whole earth be filled with his glory. You guys got it? He, he chose to partner with you. See, not only did he partner with us, and some of you are going to kind of look at me like, I'm kind of strange when I say this, but it appears that he limited his power based on how we follow what he has called us to do. And some of you are going, well, I don't know about that. Okay, well, let me just show you something. You can make a judgment on this if you want. In the book of Mark, remember Jesus, he goes out into the wilderness, and he fasts for 40 days, okay? And he comes back, and he's full of the Spirit, and he is preaching like a madman. Okay, he's, he's, like, uh, he's like one of those authors, you know, that write a new book or something, and then, you know, every church, every mega church is calling him to come speak, okay? This is Jesus, okay? He is on a preaching tour. Everybody's calling him, all right? All, the, all the, the, the mega synagogues are calling him up, saying, Jesus, come and preach here, all right? I mean, he's doing all these things, all right? In this little synagogue in Nazareth, his home church calls him up and says, Jesus, you need to come back here. You need to come back and preach to us. And uh, so Jesus said, I'd love to come back and preach to you. And he comes back and he, he, he teaches there. And he goes and he wants to do miracles. So he does this altar call. He says, okay, I preach this great message now. Altar call, everybody that needs healing. Everybody that, bring the dead people up here. Okay, everybody that needs a miracle. Everybody that needs to be set free from a demon, bring them up here. And everybody just sits. And a couple of stragglers come up that have a cold or something like that. And they, they come and they stand up here. See, the people, they refused to have faith in Jesus. They couldn't get over the fact that Jesus was one of them. And here's maybe a little rabbit trail of this, but uh, here's, here's a good uh, principle here, that you will only receive by the level of respect that you give. You got that? And I don't care if, it, if I'm talking about myself here. I don't care if I'm talking about Judy's class or your Sunday school teacher, life group, and I don't care if you're talking to your secular world with your boss. If you don't give your boss respect, you'll never receive anything from him. Is there any kids in here? Parents, you'll love this one. Kids, if you don't respect your parents, you're not going to receive anything from them. And by the way, you're breaking the fifth commandment. It means that you will die young, all right? Because <laughs> that's what it says. <laughs> But you only receive from the level of respect that you give to somebody. And what we see here with Jesus is they gave little respect to Jesus and they received little reward. Look at this account here in Mark chapter 6, verse 4. It says, And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives and in his home. And in verse 5, it says that, now look at this, verse 5. It says, He decided not to do, what does it say? He decided not to do miracles there. Is that what it says? Oh, it doesn't say that? Oh, what's it say? 
Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I misread that. He could not. He could not. He could not do any miracles there except laying on, and I love this last part, he could not do any miracles there except laying the hands on a few sick people and heal them. You know, it's kind of like, ah, you know, this, this little, you know, if we lay hands upon a sick person now and they get healed, man, we're calling everybody. Oh, they're, they're, they're going to speak everywhere, okay, because we, they healed a few sick people, all right? You know, it's kind of like almost the leftovers, and I don't think Jesus is kind of begging on this too much, but, you know, he wanted to do much more. He's looking, going, where are the dead people? Bring them up here. I mean, I want to show you my miraculous workings here. And you guys send me a few people with some colds? Yeah, I'll, I'll lay my hands, I'll heal them, but that's really not what he was looking for. Was he looking to do mighty works in front of them? He was. But it says he could not do any of those works. Why? Because he could only have, his, he only had power when the people believed. See, he has a partnership with mankind. God has set that up. And worship team, I'm about ready to close here. This is a principle, guys, we see all through Scripture. God chose, for some reason, it seems, to limit his supernatural power depending upon what we do in the natural. You guys get that? We move first in the natural, then he moves in the supernatural. And when we don't, move in the natural, and we don't believe in him, it seems to me by the, the context of the Bible that, that he limits his supernatural ability to do something. And again, search your Bible for examples. I mean, after God created mankind in Genesis 1, 27, again, dig through it, and you're not going to find too many times where God moves supernaturally without waiting for man to move naturally first. Man always moves first. God always says, you do this, okay, and then once you do this, okay, then I will move. And so many times we sit back here and say, God, we need a move of you. We need a move of God. And I think God stands back sometimes and says, you know what? You don't need a move of God. You need a move of people first. And this is the principle. We do our part in the natural first, and then he will do his part in the supernatural after that. And you know what? He doesn't ask us to do a whole lot for our part, does he? I mean, think about some of the greatest miracles in the Bible. I mean, think about in the Old Testament. What was one of the greatest miracles that you can think of? When I think of it, I'm thinking, I would love to see the Red Sea part. I mean, wouldn't that have been cool? <clears throat> These waters just somehow, I mean, I don't know how deep it is there, but to, to part and it's dry in the middle, okay, that is an incredible miracle, right? Would you agree? Do you know what Moses had to do to precipitate that miracle? God says, you know what you need to do? Hold up a stick. That's all you need to do. Imagine what Moses was going, do what? God, we need to get through here. Hold up the stick. Hold up, what are you talking about? I don't care what I'm talking, Moses, just obey. Pick up the stick and hold it up. And maybe there was some battle going on going, I don't know about this, God. I don't care what you don't know about, Moses. Pick up the stick now or they're going to get you. Pick it up. So finally he goes, okay, okay picks up the stick and goes, whoa, and the water's, because he's holding a stinking stick. That's all he's doing. He's holding a stick. He's not praying. He's not doing it. He's just going, part, you know, and, and God's going, parting them back. He doesn't require us to do a lot of the natural before the supernatural, but he does require us to do it first. I mean, here at Lifehouse, he says, you know what? I want to heal your people, Right? So he says, okay, but you've got to do it first in the natural. So what, you know, I'm not going to ask you to do a whole lot, Brett, but tell the, your spiritual leaders to come up here and just, you know, call the sick up here and just put your hands on them. What? Put our hands, I don't care if it looks goofy, Brett, just lay your hands on them and then I'll do it. He doesn't ask us to do a lot, but he asks us to do it first. And when we move first, excuse me, table. <laughs> when we do it first, okay, got too much stuff up here. Okay, then that's when he does his part. And by the way, this is the same way in our calling to fill the whole earth full of his glory. We go out, we reflect his glory to the world and the natural by demonstrating his attributes to the world, by showing the world love, by showing the world forgiveness, by showing the world compassion, by showing the world 
mercy, all that kind of, when we go out and we precipitate the move of God by showing the attributes of God after the glory has come upon us and we are changed and we are reflecting the glory of God, once we do our part in the natural, then he says, then I will do my part and that's going to precipitate my supernatural move upon the whole globe. And you look at any of these major movements of God throughout history, these great revivals that take place, you know what happens before God moves? There's men and women falling on their face before God, that they precipitate it in the natural by humbling themselves before God. And after they do that, then God comes down and he moves supernaturally upon this world. We look at God and say, God, bring your glory, bring your glory, God, to fill this earth. And God says, no, you first reflect my glory upon this earth, then I'll bring it. Now, we're fortunate to have this type of principle set up. And you know why? Because this is the principle of our very salvation. Do you know some 6,000 years ago, the first Adam, the first man, decided to move first? And you know what he did? He went and sinned, didn't he? And because that one man sinned, he lost everything for everybody. That's what Scripture says. Fair or not, this is what Scripture says, Romans 5.12 and Romans 5.14. It says, therefore, just as though one man's sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. And then in four, verse 14 is even harder. It says, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. And look at this. It says, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam. Fair or not, you were born with the bad card or bad handed card. What am I trying to say? Bad uh, hand of cards? No, that's not what I'm trying to say. Anyway. <laughs> You know what I'm trying to dealt a bad, there you go. <laughs> That's what it says. Because one man moved first and he sinned. You, everybody here, lost everything. And God always responds to the natural move of man. And what did God do? Because of one man moved and lost everything for everyone, God responds supernaturally. And he says one, sends one man back to this earth. And because of his life, he restored everything for everyone. God responds to the, man, the, the, the move of man. See, we are called from creation. You and I, every person here that's called by his name, we are called to bring him glory, to express our glory physically to him. But we are also called to reflect his glory. That we move naturally, that we go outside of these walls and we show the world the love of Christ, the mercies of Christ, the forgiveness of Christ. We begin to live that way and that precipitates God to act in a supernatural way upon this earth. That's who you are. That's your purpose. That's why you were created. Period. To give glory to God and to reflect his glory. Everything else is secondary. And that's the question to you. Are you doing that? Is your life giving glory to God? Is it reflecting the glory of God? Because if it isn't, then you are abusing who you are, who you were created to be. And you abuse that long enough, and you'll end up breaking. Your life will break apart. We need to be all about giving glory to God. Amen? Can you stand up with me and pray? Hallelujah. Father, I stand before you, before all these people, God. And God, with my life, even though I fall short so many times, God, and I thank you for your mercy, your grace, God. But God, I pray that you would receive me and every person here as that living sacrifice, God, that we would bring glory to you. Father, I pray, God, as we submit our lives to you, God, that we would dwell with you, God, within that presence, that manifest presence, God. And that, God, we would encounter you and we would 
come to comprehend in greater ways who you really are, your attributes, God, as we bask in your glory, God, that we would understand, God, your compassion for this world, that we would understand, God, the forgiveness, the grace, God, upon this world, God, that we would understand who you are, God, and that we would become more and more like you because of the time we have in your glory, God, and we would walk outside of these doors, God, not just giving you glory, but, God, that we would reflect your glory. God, create this church to be that type of church. That, God, this church would go out and we would fill the whole area of Hastings, at least, God, and all the surrounding towns with your glory, God. And, Father, as we express your glory to everybody else, God, let them catch on, God, and let them go out and give the glory to the people around them, God, and let everybody, God, of your church, God, go out and give the glory to this world, God. And as we bask in that glory, as we give that glory, God, and everybody's acting like you, Jesus, then, God, we know what that will precipitate, God, and that will precipitate a great revival that your glory will literally fill this earth, God. But help us to understand, God, it starts right here with us. We have been called by you to reflect your glory, a glory that will never fade away. Help every person here, God, live from glory to glory to glory to glory. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for that revelation. Father, this week, as we are coming into this time of Pentecost, I pray, Spirit, that you would be upon each one of these people in such a mighty way, God, that you would prepare them, God, for an incredible move that you want to make in their life. Let us be contrite before you, God, and let us dwell with you. In Jesus' name.